Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for uh, joining us today for what I think will be an extremely informative talk, because we have with us um, the Rabbi Abraham Cooper, who is the Associate de Dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And as it happens, there is so much in the news today that he could shed light on for us, for all of us, and I'm sure you will have many, many questions at the end. So I'm going to keep the introduction short and to the point. But on the day, recently, of course, big news is that uh, Trump announced the, the moving of the US Embassy to Jerusalem. And on that historic day, the rabbi was there awaiting the arrival of a high-level delegation from Bahrain, uh, which actually does not have diplomatic relations from Israel or with Israel. So there are many stories there to be told. He is also extremely knowledgeable about human rights uh, in, in North Korea. And many of you may remember that he made big news here in 1995. May I mention that? I mean, yep, sure. Okay, when, uh, and, and actually, uh, it, it was when Marco Polo, a, a magazine uh, now defunct because of this incident, uh, published an, an article uh, which was challenged uh, by the, the Wiesenthal Center. And I think if you could tell us just a little bit about that, when you, because that is your... Uh, experience, and that's why many of us know you from so long ago. He has been extremely active all over the world, and just talking a few minutes to him this afternoon is uh, he straddles so many organizations, think tanks, heads of state, and he's here to answer your questions. So I'm going to hand you right over to our special guest. Thank you so much, Mary, and good afternoon, everyone. And I want to um, just thank uh, this wonderful organization. Uh, for reasons unknown to me that keeps opening the door and inviting me back to uh, to share my perspective. I uh, very much appreciate it and do not take it for granted. Since you happen to mention uh, Marco Polo uh, incident with uh, Bungay Shinju, that was back uh, just after the Kobe earthquake in 1995 and corresponded with the 50th anniversary of the liberation by Soviet troops of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. Uh, that uh, time when many survivors were of the camp were still around, uh, many international magazines and newspapers had special cover stories, uh, not least of which Newsweek had a cover story on it. And uh, unfortunately, Marco Polo also mentioned it on its cover, but essentially what it said was the final taboo was broken, no one was gassed at Auschwitz. And the article inside essentially um, repeated uh, the unfortunate lies uh, that you would normally find in a hate publication, not in a yuppie monthly magazine. Um, I have a, probably the most positive thing that came out from all of this was I uh, developed and retained a dear friend, Koshioya, who at that time represented Bungay Shinju in the United States. And through his um, activism and uh, amazing diplomacy, um, arranged within a matter of days for a joint press conference with a person who headed up at the time the Bungay Shinju. Um, I will just add one. Uh, one, two points for historic accuracy. Number one, we never asked for the magazine to be closed. That was a decision made uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the company. And that was one of the reasons I asked for a joint press conference, because I wanted to make clear to the people of Japan what it was that incensed uh, our uh, community. It would be essentially where on the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, you would have a major magazine in the United States saying it, it never happened. Those people were never victimized. So it was a deeply offensive and, and emotional time for uh, the victims of the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, the way in which the issue resolved itself was not because of the, any brilliant term that we brought to the table, but that the international advertisers, uh, including Volkswagen, 
I think Mitsubishi Motors of America, Cartier, who have full page ads in that issue, uh, they communicated with the company and uh, it became clear that something had to be done and be done uh, 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 quickly. Um, I have been tra visiting Japan since 1985. I think this is around my 37th or 38th trip. I don't speak any Japanese. I'm not proud of that fact. Uh, my visits are usually divided in half between controversy and what we're really interested in is, for example, what we've done here, brought our UNESCO exhibition on the 3,500-year relationship of the Jewish people to the Holy Land. The Japanese version uh, opened uh, yesterday. Uh, and it's a uh, part of a long string of exhibitions, some about the Holocaust, uh, speeches and interactions with um, various parts of uh, Japanese society uh, that keeps bringing us back. And sort of, I think the bottom line message that I bring since I'm based in the Asia Pacific Rim in Los Angeles, we're the only international Jewish organization based on the Asia Pacific Rim, is that for the Simon Wiesenthal Center and many other Jewish people, and by the way, you can probably count now the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, what happens in Japan counts. We respect Japan. This is a democracy. We've got a working press table. <coughs> We're here exchanging views and, and, and ideas. Uh, we see uh, Japan um, as a very important cultural leader and of course the economic stuff you don't need, need me to talk about. Uh, but what has changed dramatically since 1985, 95, is now you have brought together in close relationship and friendship. You have the Prime Minister of Japan and Prime Minister of Israel uh, that are uh, working closely together. You have a Prime Minister of uh, Japan who gave an amazing speech at the National Holocaust Memorial of Yad Vashem some two years ago, which absolutely changed the paradigm of how Jewish people viewed Japan permanently in a positive way. Um, we have also the fact that Japan is involved in uh, the peace process. You have many projects um, uh, which are humanitarian and economic in, in uh, and we applaud those in terms of helping the Palestinians, especially since I think more than many other uh, addresses, uh, financial transparency is extremely important. Accountability is important. Uh, and I think it's very, very important as we move forward in the, this area of trying to create the right environment uh, for peace that I think Japan should be proud of its continuing involvement and would also say the fact that you are thousands of miles away from the ground zero of that issue is a plus and is being used. So we very much appreciate that. I understand your foreign minister is going next week to Israel. I've heard rumors that the Prime Minister uh, Abe wants to return there again. And when I was in Israel, I heard that Bibi Netanyahu also would like to return here. So we're actually 180 degrees from where we were back in 1985 when uh, Japan adopted a secondary boycott of Israel during an era when it felt it was tethered to uh, Arab oil and didn't have the independence to really um, uh, exercise uh, its, its creativity and independent policy in the area. So we're grateful for that and we keep coming back because what happens here is extremely important. So, um, as it happens, uh, I, on this particular trip, uh, I started out in Israel, and as uh, Mary had mentioned, I was there uh, because earlier this year, I had, uh, together with Rabbi Marvin Heyer, uh, visited, had a meeting with the king of Bahrain, King Hamad. Uh, Bahrain is a tiny nation, but strategically, it's right in the middle of the whole mess in the, uh, in the Gulf. They are tethered to um, Saudi Arabia and they're not very far from the Iranians. 
Uh, he's a Sunni king where 60% of the population is Shia. So it, it's an amazingly complicated uh, arena. Uh, nonetheless, in very short form, uh, His Majesty authored and sent his uh, son, uh, Sheikh uh, Nasser, to LA in September. We had 400 uh, <coughs> interfaith leaders from around the world. And his, the son released and read a statement called the Kingdom of Bahrain Declaration on Religious Tolerance. And so we have in hand now a plain speaking declaration from an Arab Muslim head of state who talks about religious freedom. So if I was a correspondent, I would say, OK, Rabbi, maybe you're just a gullible guy who wants to believe there's a good thing out there. So what I found in Bahrain, in, in their capital, to me was completely astounding. I was there on a Friday. And of course, Friday is the day in which uh, Muslims uh, come in larger number to the Shia and, and uh, Sunni mosques. That wasn't surprising. What was shocking was a Christian compound with a, a 40 foot cross. Churches, Christian, functioning Christian churches in an Arab nation, packed. Catholic, uh, Coptic, all different types. And then I walked a little bit further, and it happened to be that day the Hindu festival of Shiva. <laughs> I saw 14,000 Hindus going in and out of a 200-year-old temple in a capital of an Arab Muslim nation, which means that this little tiny dot for us became and becomes a very important potential role model of religious inclusion and tolerance not that some PR company sat down, let's write up something and let's see how we can become famous, but they have a tradition going back a couple of hundred years of a diverse uh, interfaith, multi-faith society. Um, I later found out that on weekends, hundreds of Coptic Christians who live and work in eastern Saudi Arabia come every week to pray in the church because churches still are illegal in Saudi Arabia. So um, we worked very hard to put together this mission and include a, a Shia cleric, uh, Hindus, Christians, uh, Buddhists, uh, and other, uh, an interesting array and colorful array uh, uh, of the group. However, uh, when President uh, Trump made his announcement that the United States uh, was uh, going to move its uh, embassy. All of my contacts in Israel said, you know, you have grandchildren here, you'll have plenty of time to spend with them because there's no way that an, a group from an Arab country that has no relations with Israel is going to show up into this environment. Um, most shockingly, they did. And the blowback from the region was quite substantial, including a direct threat from Nasrallah, who said they should all be stoned for show, having the audacity to show up to pray in Jerusalem. Uh, which brings us to the question uh, posed so eloquently here in Japan. Did President Trump suck up to Jewish global power so he can escape from Russia Gate and impeachment. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think what's uh, operating with President uh, Trump are the f couple of uh, points. Number one, as Barack Obama ran, as uh, telling the American people, "I'm not. I'm the un-George Bush." Had enough of eight years? Vote for me, Barack Obama. Mr. Trump, during the amazingly contentious and corrosive uh, uh, presidential campaign, he was running and saying, had enough of eight years, and he threw in crooked Hillary and tweets and all this other new, new stuff. But one of the things that he, uh, one of the promises he made uh, during the campaign was that he was going to move the embassy 
to Jerusalem. No one in the Jewish, American Jewish community that I know of believed him. Why? Because every other political candidate for president for the last 20 years has said exactly the same thing. And then when they get their first briefing on the Middle East, uh, continue to sign waiver after waiver after waiver. But this man does things a little bit differently. Uh, in response to this uh, impolitely uh, put uh, question, but I think based on my conversations during the last three days, everyone has the same question. What did he do and why did he do it? So if you read carefully what it is that he said, actually it's a pretty sophisticated move. He announced that he recognizes uh, it, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. It's a big thing. But he didn't announce any of the following details. Which part of Jerusalem, if any, does the United States recognize as being sovereign Israeli territory? Two, he didn't announce where the embassy is going to be placed. So uh, the way I read it is he and his team um, are frustrated by the lack of any movement to speak of in terms of the peace process and the way in which he chose to, mi to mix things up was to send a message to the Palestinian leadership, which by the way they didn't appreciate, but I think nonetheless the message is quite interesting. It is, oh you don't like this announcement? Why don't you sit down directly with the Israelis and work it out? Because if you come back to me and say there might be space for two embassies in Jerusalem. Uh, if we're looking at a two-state solution, I'm leaving open the door. Whatever you guys work out, come back to me. I hate to use this term, but then we can help you finish the deal. The message that he was sending to the Palestinian leadership was, it's time to get a move on and go uh, further. One or two other points that relate to the Gulf and the Middle East uh, peace process. Um, take the, the symbolic but significant uh, visit of these NGOs in Bahrain. Does that help potentially the peace process? Because what, I, what I've learned now in the few places in the Gulf that I visited, and by reading the incredible journey of the Crown Prince and Saudi Arabia, is that there's a significant sea change happening uh, in which the Palestinian issue will no longer be the veto issue in the Gulf. It doesn't mean that they're being abandoned by their uh, Sunni uh, uh, cousins. It means that number one, they all feel that includes Israel, includes Egypt, and everyone in the Gulf, save Qatar, an existential threat from the growing muscular positioning of Iran uh, in, the, in the region. And of course, what's tied to North Korea, the R&D and the advancements in nuclear capabilities uh, for them of the, uh, Irani uh, the Iranians and for those of us here in this region more directly uh, for the threat directly, existential threat, that uh, Japan and South Korea and others now the United States could be, uh, could be uh, facing. So uh, that uh, reality has already moved the Israelis, the Americans, the Egyptians, and various folks, including Saudi Arabia, closer on uh, military and intelligence areas. I'm just a cit plain citizen. I don't have, not a secret agent. I have no idea what they're involved with. I can guess. But the way I look at things and the way the Wiesenthal Center looks at the region, this is an opportunity for NGOs like us to try to achieve something very basic, which is break the old taboos, break the stereotypes, bring people together. Now, when we talk about bringing people together, <coughs> Uh, I took the chair lady of uh, the Bahrain dele delegation to the Alin uh, Pediatric Hospital in Jerusalem, doing absolutely amazing uh, things on a shoestring budget uh, for uh, Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, and as we saw, 
for a young girl who was uh, uh, in a coma, slowly coming out of a coma from uh, Ramallah with her parents there. What do they say? There are no atheists in the foxholes. You go to a hospital, and if you're a parent and you want your kid to get better, you're just grateful for the help. We took them to a, a place called Chalva, which is a magnificent, uh, gigantic, multi-million dollar uh, facility geared to people, young people, with uh, multiple disabilities. And their goal is to actually change the way in which society looks at people with disabilities. My goal is, no matter how big or how small your nation is, there are people on the front lines of these struggles. So I'm looking to put together, from the bottom up, people who have a similar commitment, similar challenge and similar commitment on the social fabric, uh, fabric issues, and who frankly don't care so much about politics, but if there's something, if there's a new technology that is gonna free up a part of the population to be able to be mainstream. So that's the main area that we see ourselves operating in. So what does this mean to the Palestinians? I think overall, behind all of the white noise and uh, the, the next UN vote and this, the, the Security Council, the real bottom line message uh, is one that it's time for the Israelis and the Palestinians to sit down at the same table and try to actually come up with a, a be, an outline for their two-state solution and then bring in the, the rest of the uh, players. The Palestinians don't want to play it that way. They have had till now a guaranteed lock on any resolution that they want passed at the UN Human Rights uh, uh, com uh, Committee uh, Council uh, at the UN General Assembly. If you don't think that's still operative, la uh, November 30th, they p 151 nations voted to declare that the Jewish people have no connection to Jerusalem. Feel better now? You know, completely. Uh, and by the way, we've met with the Secretary General uh, Guterres, the new guy. He's outstanding. The man ran a country before. He understands. But he's only the CEO. He doesn't have the rules. Uh, UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO, you ask anyone in Japan today about UNESCO World Heritage. We honored Mr. Matsura, who was brought in. Everyone underestimated this great Japanese diplomat. In short order, he put the economic fiasco in order. He made sure, since we're both baseball fans, he had a level playing field. And over the course of 10 years, he won back the trust of the US, the United Kingdom, et cetera. I'm going to see uh, Ms. Azulai on January 18th in Paris. She has a tougher job ahead of her because there, there's been a kind of institutionalized corruption so that even as uh, UNESCO put its stamp of approval on our exhibition, which traces 3,500 year relationship of the Jewish people to its homeland. In UNESCO, they have one vote after another saying, oh, Rachel's tomb, that's a mosque. Oh, the Western Wall, no, no, it's a different name in Arabic, it's where Muhammad tied up his horse before he went uh, to heaven. And on and on, in other words, the people who are the guardians of of history, of cultural treasures, uh, of our collective memory, they, uh, this is an institution essentially under assault and corrupted. You know, uh, Mr. Matsura managed to reassert a red line. Remember, UNESCO does not have the letter P for politics in its headline. Right now, it's been almost overrun. And uh, we were asked whether or not we're going to, uh, as we did with Mr. Matsura, the Wiesenthal Center is going to be working to get the United States back. The answer is, it depends. If she can establish that red line again, so when Japan, for example, comes with a list of things it would like to do and doesn't have to be concerned that there are regional political considerations, or Israel, which uh, Mr. Matsura uh, uh, initiated numerous uh, projects uh, with Israel. Uh, if the US, Japan, other countries can feel that the, the P is removed from UNESCO, then I think the, 
Uh, the countries will be back. A lot of the funding will return. Uh, but the bottom line is, until such time as it can actually fulfill its mandate, they're not going to come back. And so again, for the Palestinians, here's the way I see it. If we can maximize and uh, to the point where there's no coverage when a group comes from an Arab country to Israel, people who are dealing with it, whether it's business people or the human uh, area and they come also to the Palestinian territories, when it's no longer headlines, again, it reinforces the message to the Palestinians. You no longer have automatic veto. You can no longer dictate what these countries will be doing in the regional and global sense. When they understand that, I believe that'll be the best motivation of all to bring uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis to come to a two-state solution. I may be 100% wrong, but based on what I've experienced now just in the last 10 days with my own eyes, um, I actually feel optimistic behind all the white noise. So in short form, to answer the question here of uh, Yoshinori Suomatsu, um, I don't really think you have to give uh, the Jewish cabal uh, more credit than it deserves. I know that the next question will be, well, what about Kushner and what's the relationship there and et cetera. Um, I, we happen to know the Kushner family uh, for a long time before we actually ever heard of Donald Trump. Um, we have prayed together with them on Jewish festivals. I've watched some uh, young couple uh, deal with uh, their growing young family. They look pretty well grounded. Um, uh, I think at the end of the day, having had a meeting or two with the State Department and tried to figure out the hieroglyphics of this White House, it's pretty clear that there's one person who counts, and that's Donald Trump. <coughs> and if anybody here can predict, whether in domestic policy or globally, what he's going to do, please leave me your business card. I promise, even though Hanukkah is finishing at sundown, I'm going to immediately to Amazon.com and ordering 100 copies of your book to give to my suffering friends at the think tanks in Washington, D.C., who cannot figure out what it is that Donald Trump is going to do uh, next. So I think for all of us, very believe me, for those of us who want to talk about policy and human rights, uh, we're frustrated that, for example, uh, while there's a commitment to uh, appoint another um, special envoy on anti-Semitism, they haven't done it. It's not done yet. When you visit the State Department, uh, the halls are empty. We have many people who've retired, others who have left, others whose, whose contracts haven't been renewed. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is a time where, although we're uh, about a year into the presidency, whether it's domestic, especially domestic, uh, or foreign, we don't yet have a clear uh, picture. I think in terms of foreign policy, we're beginning to see something emerge. He released a statement, and the economy is doing exceptionally well. And for as long as that takes place, you can be sure, as with every previous president, when the news is good economically, he'll be there to take full credit. On the social uh, situation in the United States, I have recently uh, testified twice before congressional committees, one on domestic terrorism uh, and, uh, and, and related issues. And we are a society that's divided, even on what used to be uh, bipartisan issues. How to fight hate crimes. Uh, how, to, how to define even what hate crimes are. Uh, there's no automatic consensus on any social issue in America anymore. Uh, I think that's tragic, and I think NGOs like ours are trying very hard to take the, the battle against racism and hatred out of the, the uh, contentious and corrosive battles between the left and right in the US. Um, I don't know if we'll be successful, but it's one of the great challenges ahead of us. Uh, and uh, the latest FBI statistics on hate crimes uh, indicate 
It's been the same way since 1992. The number one target of hate in America, based on race, are African Americans, by far. The number one target for religion-based hate crimes in America are Jews, despite the fact that I think we're now a little bit less than 2% of the population. It's a uh, title we wish to give over to anyone else who's uh, interested. But, and that, that brings me to, we'll come to it in a few seconds to, to show you on, on, online. Um, Charlottesville, I'm sure that everyone here either saw it that, that day or since, seeing hundreds of young Americans, some of them members of the Klan, some of them open neo-Nazis, uh, but hundreds of young people marching in a torchlight parade through a, 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 a college town, University of Virginia, on a Friday night, uh, screaming basically Nazi slogans. Uh, it was, uh, a, to say that it was a great shock to the United States of America would be, put it mildly, um, it also reflects that parts of the alt-right, uh, so-called alt-right movement in the United States, we're talking about a new generation of extremists. They are media savvy and, to say the least, tech savvy and people who are Jewish who wrote articles about uh, criticizing candidate uh, Trump found out personally when they got attacked through the bots uh, directly delivered anti-Semitism right into their home uh, computers. Um, and a great flair for the, for the media. In other words, we're living in today that's driven by social media. It's no longer a senior producer at NHK or CBS News that can say, you know what? That was really disgusting. We're not going to put it on the air. We don't live in a world like that anymore. It's people who can figure out how to manipulate social media that can dictate the news cycle. So um, uh, it is an enormous challenge. Uh, maybe we can move ahead, uh, Ted, if we can quickly get. By the way, if anybody wants the full uh, presentation here, if you come up afterwards, it's uh, up on the cloud. You can download it at your convenience. You can email any questions you might have. Let's, let's go uh, over to the alt-right. We're just going through some. Keep going? Okay. So these four individuals, William Pierce was the man who wrote a series of racist novels, one of which was the direct inspiration for the Oklahoma City bombing. Actually, the person who did it followed the exact directions, the exact kind of vehicle, the kind of explosive used. Uh, the original novel talked about Detroit, because they wanted a race war. It happened in Oklahoma City. One of the more thoughtful, you might say intellectual people, he died, his book lives on, but he was a key component of, uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, to uh, inspire the hate movement. Richard Butler, he ran a compound, a racist compound in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Now that had a direct relationship to the Simon Wiesenthal Center because one of his followers loaded up his van with explosives and drove 1,500 miles to Los Angeles and had, and later he told, admitted to the FBI, he had two goals, to shoot up the Museum of Tolerance, our educational arm, and then to go out and murder an immigrant so when, in his confession, he said when he canvassed our museum, he understood that he could get in, but he would never get out. It was a correct analysis. So what he did is he looked for an uh, a, um, a easier target. He landed up shooting at a summer day camp with Jewish kids the next morning, injuring many of them, and then went out and gunned down a Filipino-American postal worker shot him in the back and murdered him. 
He's dead. Tom Metzger, San Diego, California, actually got a lot of votes when he ran for Congress. Sort of like the main spokesman for racists and bigots and anti-Semites in America for a quarter of a century. Well, he's 80 years old. And Matt Hale, uh, we're, we're kind of lucked out, if you will, because he was one of the first younger racists who figured out the power of the internet. He was fairly, um, uh, very adept at attracting others to follow him. Um, he had a slight problem, however. He threatened the life of a United States federal judge. So if you want to see Matt Hale, he's got another 20, 30 years on a sentence in jail. <coughs> what that meant was for about a decade, it doesn't mean we had less bigots or racists. We've had many horrible incidents. But a kind of leaderless, no one who really stood out beyond that David Duke has been around you know, forever. What we saw in Charlottesville, and also emerging during the campaign, presidential campaign, was a whole new generation of uh, leaders who uh, go on to the next. Uh, let's go back one. Richard Spencer, you might remember him. There was a kind of celebration of the alt-right in Washington, and he got carried away and actually went Heil Trump. Other of the more sophisticated folks in the alt-right movement were furious because they understood that to, in order to attract the mainstream of America, you need different vocabulary, different approach. And if you take a look in Europe, you have now far-right parties, extreme far-right parties even, part of who have succeeded by dressing up their agenda in, in ways that are acceptable to average people. They've been watching carefully the movements in, uh, in Europe. Go on to the next. So he had something called, in Washington, the National Policy Institute. Well, that sounds about as mainstream as you can get. If you read the fine print, it talks about protecting the rights of white Europeans who live in America. And dressing up extremism in the classic uh, Washington speak of a think tank. Okay. Here it is, an independent organization dedicated to the heritage, identity, and future of European descent in the United States and around the world. All right. All right. By the way, he's a graduate of University of Chicago. He's no slouch. This is called the Daily Stormer. It's a neo-Nazi daily publication. When I started working at the Simon Wiesenthal Center 40 years ago when we started, there were not any neo-Nazi publications. First of all, you had to get it in the mail or it would be on the a flyer on your windshield. Secondly, if I had a dollar for every uh, misspelled word, I'd be a rich man. Take a look at the layout of the Daily Stormer. Extremely sophisticated. The hate is there. The packaging is brand new. Okay. Okay, and here we have the symbol of uh, the extreme alt-right. Uh, and although we sped by it, there's actually one in which you see this symbol used by a Jap in, in a Japanese uh, Twitter account that mix and matches all sorts of, uh, of interesting uh, dimensions. And I think that's the other unspoken factor here. We live in a world dominated now by social media. And these symbols, which may have nothing to do with daily life in Japan, nonetheless, those trends are very attractive to extremists who are here. Okay, And here's, uh, be careful when you refer to it, but this is actually fairly accurate. If you don't recognize any of these names, groups, or institutions, you got a little homework to do because this is the 2017-2018 lineup 
of the uh, far, far right neo-Nazi uh, uh, movement that has very little in common with the four folks we showed you a couple of slides ago. So in the lead up to um, Charlottesville, a lot of it was promoted online. The name of the gathering was called Unite the Right. In Yiddish, we use a term called chutzpah. It's a little bit of chutzpah, of nerve, for the far right to try to co-opt what's called the right by saying we're going to have a, a gathering that's going to unite all elements. And for those of you who know a little bit about uh, uh, history, you'll see some of the uh, visuals okay, that are fascist and Nazi-like, even ripped off directly from the 1930s uh, of Germany. And of course, you see front and center there the Jewish star and someone taking a sledgehammer to it. Um, those of you who know about American uh, history, one of the earliest flags went to Massachusetts during the American Revolution was a flag that had a snake on it, a serpent, that said, don't tread on me. Here you see them co-opting a sort of historic symbol in America. And um, originally brought forth by Benjamin Franklin, who would be turning over in his grave, to see, again, what you could modify online and we are dealing with millennials who are so proud of the fact that they know nothing but have access to everything, then you're starting with a clean slate and a lot of people are drinking the Kool-Aid. This was the scene on the Friday night and those were the chants that as they moved through this peaceful university town, these are the chants. Blood and soil, of course, is a Nazi uh, slogan. One people, one nation, end immigration. Well, there are a lot of people in America who want to end illegal immigration, but one people, one nation is the take off on the Nazi slogan of Ein Volk. This is, this is stuff rife with, with, uh, with Nazi, uh, and when it says, you will not replace us, that means that any minority person who's watching this feels they're under attack. But just in case the Jews thought they weren't included, Hebes will not divide us. And they were uploading the visuals from uh, live from the event. So in case the mainstream media missed it, they were going to make sure that the world took note of what they did. And from the street theater, political theater, and street theater, unfortunately, it's a huge victory for them. It, it thrust them right into the national conversation in the United States. And these are some of the groups that showed up also on, on a Saturday morning. Take a look at the, uh, you, if you take a look, you will not see a swastika. You see other affiliated uh, symbols because uh, although some do carry the swastika, it's not really uh, acceptable. That image still is still too jarring. And so you'll see all sorts of uh, other symbols that are well identified with Nazi-like groups in Europe and elsewhere. The Beware the International Jew, um, again, comes from the Nazi era. It's a ripoff. This poster was also all over University of Houston and other places around the United States. Okay. Um, do we want to stop there and take some questions? Or we want to make sure we have enough time. I think we probably have some questions from the floor. Um, okay, so shall we? Then? Yeah, okay. yeah. And again, just this is my colleague, Dr. Ted Gover who put together uh, really the, a magnificent uh, opening event yesterday, the exhibition, uh, fluent in Japanese, smart enough to have married a Japanese woman, uh, who helps uh, the, advise the Simon Wiesenthal Center 
on all things uh, Asia. So he's with us from Southern California. And, uh, and anyway, anyone who wants to get access to the full uh, report, which goes into great detail about the terrorism, you may have seen a couple of things in Japanese. And you might be asking, you mean ISIS is re trying to recruit in Japan? The people who beheaded the journalists? are actually think they're going to find Japanese people who would join them? And the answer is yes. And the reason is that ISIS, or whoever, whatever the new letters will be for the reconstituted group in the, in the real world, they're not looking for a mass movement. They're looking for individuals who they can turn and make part of a, a global terrorist uh, operation. So if you don't know anything about it, it would be a good place to start because even here, uh, I remember it may have been the last time uh, I was here at one of the other. Uh, I remember a Japanese journalist asked me two questions the day after the beheading A, what did Japan do to deserve this? And B, how do we get out of the crosshairs of this situation? And the tragic answer was Japan did nothing wrong. Uh, and there is no escape, because for uh, the Islamists, uh, even if you're Muslim, if you don't fit their profile, as we know from what happened in, in Egypt, the murder of, of other Muslims at prayer, uh, we are dealing with a worldwide threat of uh, terrorism, mostly Islamist terrorism. Uh, social media especially is the fabric that stitches this stuff together. Uh, the good and bad news is ideas have no borders, which means there are a lot of young people in the Gulf and elsewhere in the Arab world who are saying, why can't I go to Israel? And Israelis saying, well, why can't I visit Kuwait? And uh, so millennials have their own kind of, uh, of energy. On the other hand, there's no fact checker on the internet. Uh, it's impossible to stop any idea, really, on the net if someone wants to communicate it. And uh, Japan, America, Singapore, Canada, Australia, obviously all of the democracies in Europe, we're in exactly the same boat. In order to degrade the marketing capabilities of terrorists, we need all of the social media companies fully invested in this issue and voluntarily being, heading up a consortium to degrade their marketing capabilities. Uh, ISIS is now destroyed on the ground, and that's a good thing. ISIS won the war of marketing on the internet. One of the main reasons was nobody showed up online to oppose them. So that that is uh, sort of a snapshot of where we're at. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh, you'll take care of it? I'm sorry. I'm going to. Okay. okay. You may ask, ask sure. the question. Benjamin Fulford, yes, Weekly okay. Geopolitical News and Analysis. Um, last time we spoke here, you had just had one of my books banned for being anti-Semitic. And when I asked you what exactly in the book was anti-Semitic, you said that I mentioned that a disproportionate amount of Iraqi civilians had died as a result of George Bush Jr.'s invasion of Iraq. Now. George Bush Jr., as far as I know, is an evangelical Christian. So here, in my eyes, it looks like you have a Jewish person banning a book by a, written by a person with Jewish an ancestry that's condemning genocide. So I'm just wondering, why did this take place? Well, I, I think you have some selective memory about my response to your publication. If you go back and read the book that has your, your authorship on it, I think you'll see that uh, it was an appropriate assignation on it. Thank you. Well, um, if I may follow up, mm -hmm. I found out from editors at uh, Tokuma Publishing that, in fact, they were paid uh, large bribes to uh, issue uh, advertisements that were misleading. Will, will that lead to a question? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, I'm, I mean, uh, were you aware that there were bribes at Tokuma Publishing that behind this whole uh, incident? I don't, it's not a, an arena in, it, let's just put it this way. Bribery is not part of uh, uh, the arsenal that the Simon Wiesenthal Center utilizes. We're here in the marketplace of ideas. 
you're a very lucky man that you can stand up in front of legitimate folks in the media and have your say. That's fine. Those are the rules here. Uh, but I'm not aware of any bribery. And um, I don't think you win in the marketplace of ideas by using bribes. And I'm not sure that ever took place. I have no knowledge. Well, of that. The, the, okay. 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 All right. So Thank we'll you. take the next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, and please state your affiliation. This is being uh, recorded, so. I'm oh, sorry, you, you are a member of the press, yes. right? Yes, thank you. My name is Richard Susilo. I'm from uh, Indonesia, Indonesian journalist. Uh, very simple question, and I need simple uh, answer also. Uh, after the uh, announcement of the, uh, from Trump mm -hmm. moving the uh, Jerusalem as a capital of uh, Israel. What is your position in this? Are you agree or not? Second question, you have been to Indonesia and you know Abdurrahman Wahid, our president, yes. you talk to him. What is your, uh, actually your, your image about our country, Indonesia, and the, uh, as you well known also, uh, that Indonesia very strong opposing the uh, capital city, uh, the Trump, uh, announcement, uh, Jerusalem as capital city. So, uh, do you have any idea uh, so for two, Indonesian people? There are two questions, yes. or three now. One is what I think about the uh, Trump move. Move. Number two, uh, to make some comments about Indonesia, Indonesia. President Wahid, etc. Yes. And would I understand why many people in Indonesia are not enthusiastic about such a move? Right. Is that correct? Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, number one, Yes, the Simon Wiesenthal Center enthusiastically uh, endorsed the announcement by President Trump. I went to some detail as to why I don't see this. I, I see the move as one that's designed, a sophisticated uh, move by the president to encourage the Palestinians to talk directly with the Israelis and for them to come up with the outlines for a two-state solution. So I would just say to the people who are opposed to it, and there are many, including many people in the US Congress who are opposed to it, is to, uh, I know it's sometimes difficult to take seriously a move from a leader who often says things through a tweet. I think in this case, the announcement is quite sophisticated. It leaves open all of the doors for direct discussion between the two parties involved. Uh, uh, to come up with, uh, with a solution. Now, having said that, um, I have visited on uh, two occasions your wonderful country. I will admit to you, when I first came, I was wearing a baseball cap. Okay, about 10 minutes into my being in Jakarta, and it's, besides it's warm, I took off the cap, I wore my kippah throughout my stay, both stays, in, uh, in Indonesia, and I felt uh, respected everywhere I went. I was pleasantly shocked. Now, number two, I had uh, the honor to have lunch with, uh, at the home of the late, uh, with the late President Wahid, who was an amazing, amazing individual. His knowledge, uh, working knowledge of religions, including Judaism, far outstripped, I hate to say it, a lot of Jews that I know. Um, he was a great visionary, even though he was going blind when I, by the time I got to meet him. I quoted King David's famous line that says, there are people who have eyes and can't see. In the case of President Wahi, the opposite was true. He couldn't see very well, but his vision was amazing. And to also be, uh, to be in a, a home in which the, the daughters are all sort of of course, now very uh, involved, and uh, Yeni actually opened our uh, International Conference of Religions Against Terrorism after Bali. She actually opened the program uh, there. So um, I've always found my meeting with President Wahid as uh, an inspiration because many Jewish people, very fearful, and many ways correctly so. There are imams in the United States now every week we're saying terrible things about Jews. But when pe someone would say, well, isn't Islam horrible? Or is it a threat? You know, I said, really, it depends. Because I met a great scholar who's a religious Muslim. 
uh, and he's all about respect. So um, I think it was a great tragedy for humanity that he died at such a relatively young age. Um, but he continues to serve as a source of inspiration. I'll also tell you that a, uh, one of the uh, people from Indonesia, at my request, was kind enough to fly into Jerusalem and join the Bahraini delegation for the last part of their visit. I did so because I know that there are numerous uh, theologians, Muslim theologians in Indonesia, who have uh, already are deeply engaged in theological counterattacks to ISIS, Al Qaeda, and other extremists. To me, as a Jew, and to other people who are not Muslim, we obviously are looking in this uh, dangerous era for the voices, the true legitimate voices of moderation, to first of all be identified, uh, to be held up uh, in, in the broadest possible terms. And obviously, if you're going to defeat Islamist extremists in the marketplace of ideas, it's not going to be a rabbi or a Catholic priest that's going to do it. It's going to be from Islam. So I see the uh, Indonesia, Indonesian people and, and some of the leaders playing uh, a, a long range, uh, powerful uh, a part in the hope for defeat of extremism. You have the largest Muslim population in the world, the largest Muslim country in the world, and uh, what you have to say is extremely important to us. Now, just again to come back to the issue of Jerusalem, um, I don't think that anyone in Indonesia would be um, happy if the United Nations sent a letter one day to your president and said, you know, we don't think Jakarta should be your capital. Uh, we'd like you to move it. Uh, maybe you have, what, 17,000 islands. Take an underdeveloped island, you know, move it there. Uh, no Indonesian would, would uh, respond positively to that kind of diktat. Now look, Jerusalem has always been a unique city. Um, various religious sects, including national churches, from Sweden to Tsarist Russia, and uh, almost everybody else in between, uh, the French, they're invested in uh, spiritually and, and in terms of land in the holy city. It's a unique and special place. Uh, if you take a look at the difference between 1948 to 67, when Jordan barred Jewish people from their holy place, never able to pray there, and what's happened since 1967 till today, um, I think it's about seven, eight years ago, right now, during Hanukkah, I hosted seven leaders, religious leaders, uh, from Indonesia in Israel. We spent a week together, they spent a day in Ramallah, but mostly touring Israel and enjoying the Hanukkah festival as Muslims. It was one of the most spectacular experiences of my life. So um, I, I would hope that, uh, you know, instead of going to mass demonstrations, uh, and, and um, let me let me put it this way. I asked uh, one of the people of the delegation at the end of the visit to Israel, so what did you learn? They went twice to Al-Aqsa, the first morning and the Friday. And he said, to tell you the truth, we in Indonesia, when we see the news from, from the Holy Land, and there's always a press conference from the, either the PA or Hamas, the backdrop is the picture of Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock. That's a signal to me as a Muslim that whatever you really think about these guys, they are standing up in a religious struggle for our cause. What I found out here during a week in Israel is it's not a religious battle. It's a political dispute. You said political dispute? I'm from Indonesia. I got enough political disputes in my own home country to last me a very long time. So I thought that was a very important uh, statement. And because I think there is a special place for Indonesians to be playing in the future, the best suggestion I could make is encourage responsible leaders uh, in Indonesia. Come to the Holy Land, see for yourself, set aside time to meet with the PA, go to Ramallah, meet the Jews, meet the Arabs, 
uh, take a measure, uh, you know, pray in, in, in Al-Aqsa. Take a measure for yourself of what the situation actually is because the unique perspective of Indonesians in long range can make, have a big influence on events as they unfold around the world. My name is Hiroshi Kudo from JCash News. Um, my question is that uh, you criticized Japan's girls group Nogizaka 46 for its uh, Nazi style costume. Did you receive any explanations or apologies from that group? Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. You know, we had in the last couple of years two incidents involving Sony Music uh, with two groups. Uh, the first one. Kishidan. Right, Kishidan, a famous group, they had the kind of SS uh, uniforms. Uh, and the second one were the, the pretty little girls dressed up in Nazi uh, uh, items. So after the first, we were in touch with Sony Music. Uh, we explained our concerns. They apologized. When it happened a second time, the, we had a more robust response. And to respond to your question, and, and uh, we're very proud of the fact that at the opening of our exhibition yesterday, two senior officials of Sony Music came. I want to emphasize it, the Wiesenthal Center is, doesn't see enemies in Japan. When it see, it's usually a situation where there's uh, a lack of understanding of no, or knowledge. But in the case when you have an international brand like Sony Music, you can't just say, well, it's teeny boppers, they like it because the color schemes look interesting. So when we were invited a few months back to present at Sony headquarters to, what was it, about 130 or 40 people, most of whom were the age of my, uh, almost the age of my oldest grandchild, so I really felt old. Uh, but it's exactly the people we wanted to meet. We wanted them to understand that uh, we know there's not going to be a major Nazi movement in Japan. But we also need to know that in the era of downloading music, live streaming, and all the rest, that symbol in Europe and that symbol in North America is a live symbol. So the downloading of that kind of music by real neo-Nazis should be of concern to everyone. And there's one other comment that you know, I think that people here in Asia need to, uh, need to remember. And that is that if you read the Nazi ideology, if Hitler had won, no one of color anywhere in the world would have been free or safe. No one. And it, uh, it was just brought home recently again in Asia, you may have seen a few weeks ago, that in the Wax Museum in Indonesia, they put up Hitler, which is not exactly a headline and would not get our attention, frankly. But what they did here is they made wallpaper out of the entrance of the Auschwitz camp of Arbat Machfrei, and young people were coming and taking selfies with Hitler with the Auschwitz background. Now, we urge, we put out a, we asked by the media for a comment, we said it should be taken down. Three days later, it was down, not because of Jewish power, but because the owner of this company is there to make money, sort of like did some homework, was getting questions from journalists in the UK and all over the world, and came to understand that this was an unintentioned but very powerful slander of victims. And that's not why he was in business. So he did the right thing, he took it down, uh, end of issue. So uh, the same thing here with Sony. Sony responded. Uh, appropriately. They sent someone immediately to LA. I flew here uh, and based on that we came back a few months later because our real interest was to take the unfortunate incident and turn it into a, a teaching moment because whether we like it or not it's the young people who are the cultural interpreters, okay? They have tremendous clout with, their, with the next generation coming up. Generally, they don't touch these third rail issues, but when they do, they're going to hear from us. Uh, I'm sorry, we've run out of time, and I believe we have to vacate the room. And 
No, no more time, right? We have to leave. Well, I'll be around for a few more minutes. I'm heading to the airport. I know that there were two people who raised their hands. Yeah. If you want to, we can so we, take it outside. So while you're cleaning, should, should we just have them come to the table and talk to them, or? Okay, so, yeah, so let them, let's just have them come up to talk Good. to you here. After. Okay. So we'll have to close once, but um, fortunately you have a few minutes. You might be able to speak to the people who have raised their hands. Right. But um, I'd like to extend a, a big thank you to you. Thank you, Mary. Very enlightening, uh, insightful, gives us a bit of hope. That's what your message you said was about yes. hope in, in all the things you discussed today. And... Um, also, warm, very warm thanks to Mr. Gover. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you.